in Ephesians chapter 6. We're wrapping up our series here in this particular letter of the Apostle Paul, Ephesians chapter 6. Hunter and Braden Gandhi of Bedford, Michigan, have an unusually strong sibling relationship. Braden, seven years of age, has cerebral palsy. And his older brother, Hunter, 15 years of age, uh, wants to do something to help. I think we have a picture of the two of them here. Hunter here is carrying Braden. And uh, Hunter has decided that this summer he's going to do a 40-mile walk with Braden on his back to draw attention to the plight of those with cerebral palsy. Pretty mature thing for a junior high kid to do, isn't it? Demonstrates unique bond that exists between these two brothers. That family relationship does represent a, a remarkably strong bond. Proverbs 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Something about the family relationship that is unusually strong and sometimes comes out most clearly in this context of adversity. It's often been noted that blood is thicker than water. Hunter and Braden's relationship might not be the experience of your family. Last week I, I posed a connection card question. What do you enjoy most about family reunions? Well, one of you responded. The question starts with the assumption that you enjoy family reunions. It says, in my case, it is more like Jacob and Esau. Remember that account? Esau was wanting to kill Jacob, and Jacob runs for his life and eventually returns to the land of Israel. But uh, he did so. That family reunion was, uh, was approached with fear and trepidation, right? He wasn't sure if Esau was going to forgive him or not. This individual says, that's kind of how it is in my family. <laughs> uh, things aren't always really good. And certainly we are sinners, and that means that family relationships are not easy or problem-free. The fall has impacted every aspect of creation. right? Mind, body, spirit within a person, and also our relationships with one another, even within families. In many ways, the things that make family bonds so strong are also the things that make it so difficult. Brutal honesty, intensive interaction, sometimes in a very enclosed space, acute familiarity, you can't hide things from family that you can hide from other people. So these are certainly the things that make family relationships not only strong, but also at times challenging. C.S. Lewis uh, had an interesting insight as to why we love family, uh, maybe in some ways as to why the bond is so strong. He suggested that we love the things, we love certain things, we love the things close to us, not because they are so inherently great, but because they are ours. We love our families, not because they are rich or talented or funny, but because they are ours. They represent the place where we know and are known. It's truly a place where not just everyone knows your name, but they know you. Right? something very, very powerful about that connection. Now, Jesus had a lot to say about family as well. Matter of fact, every time the topic was raised, and there's four key texts here 
in the Gospels where Jesus really addresses this issue, where the topic of, of biological family is, is sort of brought up to Jesus. And in each case, he takes the opportunity to point to something beyond biological family. He takes the opportunity to point to an even stronger bond. On one occasion in Mark's Gospel, they come to tell him that his brother and sister and mother, or his brothers and his mother actually, are, are, are wanting to talk with him. And Jesus says, who are my mother and my brothers? He really disses them. <laughs> he doesn't even pretend to recognize them. Oh, he's proving a point. He, he goes on to say, whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This is, the, this is the even stronger relationship that exists, the even stronger bond that exists. It's not simply being a part of a biological family, but is being a part of God's family. On another occasion, someone steps out from the crowd and says, in essence, it would be great to be related to you. What a privilege to be your mother to be able to have taken care of you since you were a baby and to have that strong family bond. Jesus replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. But yes, family relationships, blood relationships are, are remarkably strong, but there's something that is even stronger. There's a bond that is even more significant and important. And of course, he's talking about the family of God, the church. So it's interesting as we step into a context here, a text in Ephesians 6 that really is laced with family terminology. That we ask ourselves that question, are we committed to the family of God? Does the family of God does the church have the place of prominence in our minds that it did in the mind of Christ? Are we committed to God's family? Have we identified ourselves formally with God's family? I think an important question as we think through this notion of family bonds. There is a relationship that is thicker than blood. And Paul's going to describe this in these closing verses of Ephesians chapter 6. Let's read, follow along as I read Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 21. Hear the word of the Lord. So that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers. And love with faith in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. And the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Paul's letters were generally dictated. He would sort of speak them out and someone would write them down. Matter of fact, the indications are that Paul's eyesight was not that good, and so this might have played a role in it, but it would have been cultural as well. But at the end of the letter, it seems as if here he picks up his own pen and he writes with his own hand. We see this in some of his other letters as well, where he says specifically, now see my writing in my own hand, as he closes, a, a bit of a, of a, a personalized touch and perhaps a, 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 an ability to sort of notarize or authorize this correspondence as being truly from him. And it seems that that's what we have here in these final verses, is Paul now picking up the pen and, and himself in his own writing, uh, extending this very concise, pointed, final 
challenge, a pronounced blessing on the church. And he calls them brothers. Verse 23, peace be to the brothers. Here's the heart of his benediction, his closing prayer. He calls them brothers. He's not speaking to these people because he's angry with them. He's not speaking to them or writing to them in some sort of cold, callous, sterile fashion, just sort of a lecture. No, he's writing to them as siblings, as fellow members of the family of God. And he writes very interestingly in these final two verses in the third person. Peace be not to you, the Ephesian church, but peace be to the brothers. The sense was that this was probably a circular letter. In other words, it was probably going to land in Ephesus, the capital city within Asia Minor, but it was probably going to be passed around and be able to be read in a number of different settings. And so uh, we have this sort of broad sense in which this letter is, is able to be read just as easily by us as it was by the people of, of Ephesus. Peace be to the brothers. Timeless closing thoughts in these verses. Uh, two things particularly that he wishes for them in verses 23 and 24. First he wishes that we... The brothers, his fellow members in the family of God, that we would have peace. We would have peace. Peace to the brothers. The concept of peace has already been introduced in this letter back in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 18, and uh, predominantly it has this sense of reconciliation. The point is, the sense is that we've been reconciled to God, we've been brought to peace with God, and, and as a consequence, we've also been reconciled to each other within the family of God. And so this seems to be what Paul is, is praying for here, that, the, that God's children, that the brothers and sisters, would live at peace. That they would live lives marked by reconciliation. And truly this was at the heart of our calling back in chapter 4 when, when Paul began to sort of move from the theological foundation of the gospel into the practical application. He, he says, I want you to walk worthy of the calling that you have received. And right at the outset, he says he wants them to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This was at the heart of, of, of our calling it's, it's not a side thing. And here again as he closes, he wishes and prays for peace among the brothers. He expands on this by saying, and love with faith. I think really there's two main requests here. I think this love request is coupled with peace. He prays that they would have peace and love with faith. He doesn't want faith alone. He doesn't want dead orthodoxy. As important as orthodoxy is, the believing of the right things, but he wants love along with that faith. So he prays for peace and for love with faith. Persistent theme. Paul would often, when giving ethical exhortations, would urge them to live in peace. If it, all, if it is all possible, live at peace with all men. Here in 2 Peter chapter 3, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. So here's this aspect of moral righteousness. Very important, right? All of the, the various commands about sexual purity, uh, about uh, uh, lying, about stealing, uh, all sorts of, of, of moral issues that, that, that we are called to address in our lives would be without spot or blemish morally, but the expectation is also that we will be at peace. That we will be people whose lives are marked by love. So he wishes that they would have peace. And then in verse 24, he extends that to ask that they would have grace. 
He wishes that they would have grace. He prays that they would be blessed, that God would shine upon them. But notice the condition for grace in verse 24. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Our love and, again, commitment to one another is no casual manner, matter to the Apostle Paul. Matter of fact, as he closes his letter to the, the church in Corinth, he, he says, if anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. O Lord, come. Clearly this was important as Paul leaves closing thoughts with the churches and challenges them with this theme of love. And Paul has a particular type of love or a particular quality of love in mind. Grace be to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Uh, this is a very interesting word as it's used in this context. Usually it's referring to, uh, to, uh, to immortality. In fact, it appears in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the transformation of our bodies from from mortality to immortality, to, to things that are subject to death and aging and disease, to bodies that, that are immune from those things. Right? That's the idea. He's calling them, and this grace is pronounced on those who would have a love immortal. I think the NIV gets it right by saying an undying love. It's a good rendering. Well, how do you know if you possess an undying love for the Lord Jesus Christ? And after all, if this blessing of grace, God's goodness, God's smile, to live under His approval demands that we be people who love the Lord Jesus Christ, then what does that mean? When we look at the Scriptures, there's really little doubt. Jesus addressed this Head on. How do you demonstrate love for Jesus? What are the marks of loving Jesus? You love, your love for Christ is demonstrated by your love for one another. Matthew 25, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. This, these are Jesus' words to his disciples. And the disciples said, you know, we never found you naked and had to clothe you. We never found you hungry and had to feed you. And Jesus says, but when you did it unto the least of these, you did it unto me. John 13, by your love for one another, all men will know that you are my disciples. How do we demonstrate our fidelity, our loyalty, our love to Christ? By our love for one another. Hebrews chapter 6, this has become one of my favorite verses in recent months. I've written it on some of your birthday cards actually. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown Him. Catch this. As you have helped His people and continue to help them. How do you show love to God? How do you show love to Christ? By loving His people. And we know the, the, the connections of Christ as the head and the church as the body that we are the manifestation of Christ in the world. We are His body. So the connection should be clear for us that we love Christ by loving one another. And Paul, in a masterful way here, talks about this theme of love, loving others, verse 23, and then loving Christ, verse 24, the inseparable nature of, of love for Christ and for others. <laughs> They're bound up together. They're fused So these great wishes that Paul extends. Well, what would it look, for, look like for us to live as family? How would we begin to process through, if, if, if love is so important, if it's, if it's Paul's sort of parting shot in these final verses to the church in Ephesus, that they would be people of peace who are given to love, uh, how would we put feet on that? What, what would it look like? And I... I believe that Paul, as he closes the letter here, draws attention 
indirectly to the type of love that he has in mind. In other words, we see love embodied in this text. We see it in action. We see it at work. I want to suggest we first of all see it in Paul's own life. We see in verse 20, just before the verses we read this morning, chapter 6, verse 20, Paul writes, for which I am an ambassador, he talks about the gospel, verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. The third time in the letter that Paul has referenced his chains. And it seems clear that he's doing this in order to demonstrate to the people his love for them. He says, I'm in this condition, I am imprisoned right now, facing the potential of death because I love you and because I'm committed to bringing the gospel to you. A pretty great mark of love, isn't it? We see in Paul's relationship with these believers, his brothers, that families endure hardship for one another. This is a mark of love. This is how we see love embodied in this text. Our younger children, we're celebrating Anna's graduation today, so big open house stuff, family coming in from all of my parents are here this morning, so a lot of fun. And uh, I was thinking about all of the concerts, the orchestra concerts that our younger kids have gone to. Well, we've gone to, right? Most all of them have been really enjoyable, and especially as they get older and a little more polished. And uh, But there's a lot of things you do that, you know, they might not float your boat so much, but you go because you love your kids, right? You make that investment. And I think here's what we see. This is part of what families do. <laughs> they endure hardship for one another. They do things they don't want to do because they love. Interesting to think about that in the context of the church, isn't it? What have you given up for family? What is, what, what, what is it that you, are, are you given to enduring things that you don't like? Because you love your brothers and sisters. Practical demonstration of, of what it is to be family, what it is to love. I think we also see in Paul that families invest in relationships. Families, family members invest in relationships. It takes time, it takes effort. I mean, think about what's going on here. Paul is writing to this church, and he's very concerned. He, he wants them to pray for him. He'd already mentioned that in the preceding verses, but he wants them to be able to pray knowledgeably. He's, he's vested enough with them that he's, he wants to send them an update. He wants them to know how he's doing even goes to the length to send uh, Tychicus to them with this message. And, and presumably Tychicus was not only going to convey the letter, but he had some other things he was going to say too. I'm sure they had a lot of questions. And so he's, he's investing in them. Even the act of writing a letter uh, is, is an investment. It's, it's an expression of love. Letters take time. It's getting easier and easier to send letters, isn't it? Letters. Okay. Or, you know, now it's just K, you know. Uh, and, of course, email, you know, that's a little bit easier, but you kind of, you know, you just quickly shoot it off. I mean, to actually sit down with a piece of paper and then have to stick a 44-cent stamp or go to the store to buy the stamp, right, if you're out. Uh, to actually physically send a letter, and of course, in the you know in the first century, it was a little more involved yet than that. You know, there's not the bic sitting in your desk. You know, you're having to uh, write on parchment, which itself was was pretty valuable and not readily available. And uh, it wasn't a 44 cent postage stamp. How much do you think it cost in the currency that day to send Tychicus to Ephesus? From Rome. I mean, you're talking about an investment. 
how, how, much, how much value did Paul place upon his relationship with the Ephesian believers? That's pretty amazing, isn't it, when you stop and think about it? Now, a major thing to just get out a piece of paper and jot a note. Some of your letter writers, Diane Seitzman is a letter writer. Heather Dilley is a wonderful minister of writing letters. Great discipline. Sure, it doesn't come naturally. You kind of make yourself do it. And that's a wonderful type of ministry. But it takes investment. You're investing in people's lives. Obviously, Paul's praying for these people. We've seen that already surfacing. He's praying for them as he writes here. That, that's, that's what he's writing and recording is his prayer. What a great ministry, a great investment. By the way, if you commit yourself to praying for people, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, it will change the way you view them. You know, we love things that we're vested in. If you make the choice to be vested in brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, that's going to make all the difference. So families invest in relationship. One, one of the ways we see, again, love embodied in this text. John Stott writes, prayer, correspondence, and visits are still three major means by which Christians and churches can enrich one another and so contribute to the building up of the body of Christ. Now today, of course, Paul's writing letters, right? Because he couldn't be with them physically. But even, and even John even alluded to this as he's writing 3 John, verse 13, I think it is. John says, I have more things I'd like to say to you, but um, you know, I, I want to do it with paper and you know, I don't want to do it with paper and ink. I'm waiting to see you in person. You know, Well, most of us have the opportunity to actually just spend time with someone, have a cluster of people, are there a group of people that you, that you connect with regularly, that you're investing in their lives, that you're carving time out of your schedule to value some relationships. You can't have that relationship with everybody in the church. Are there a few people that you say, I am, I am committed to these people and I am willing to make an investment in their lives? That's a mark of love. I think it's also embodied here in, uh, in the life of Tychicus. Tychicus was one of Paul's co-workers. He was a native of the province of Asia. So he had left home. But we know he traveled with Paul, at least on his third missionary journey, and had been in Rome with Paul, probably caring for him the way arrest worked that day. Paul was in prison, but uh, others outside had to provide for his needs, bring him meals, and that sort of thing. So Tychicus was presumably part of that support team there in Rome. But he had kind of uprooted uh, because of his love for Paul, his love for the gospel. And uh, we see, I think, a couple of things from from Tychicus's life about what real love looks like. Uh, let me put it this way. Families get involved and seek to encourage. Families get involved and seek to encourage. Notice what we're told about Tychicus's ministry. That's a tongue twister. Uh, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and... and that he may encourage your heart. So Tychicus was going to be bringing information. He was going to be bringing the letter from Paul. But he was also going to encourage their hearts. Very interesting word, encourage. Uh, it's, it's actually a compound word. Um, the, the image in my mind, I think the image that should be in your mind, is of having your arm around someone. It means to, uh, to speak to someone, but it means to speak alongside of them or to call them alongside. It's kind of the act of a mentor, right, who sort of comes along, or a friend, who comes alongside, maybe in the midst of discouragement uh, or maybe when you're out of line and, and, and they come along and say, hey, watch it. You know, we were at the ball game and a couple of drunk people behind us and... Uh, some language was being used Friday night that we don't usually use in our home, you know. And uh, I was just getting ready to shoot my dirty glare back there when someone next to, to him reached over and said, can it, take it down. Actually physically just reached over, put his hand on this guy, 
That's, that's this word here. It can have the idea of encouragement. It can have the idea of, of confrontation. But it's a very hands-on kind of concept. And Tychicus was going to come to the church in Ephesus and put his arms around them. And he was going to speak truth to them. He was going to encourage them. He was going to challenge them. Families get involved, seek to encourage. Families don't mind their own business. Dorothy Carpenter was one of the charter members of this church. She died several years ago. But uh, when, the, when we were meeting in the facility, our, the original property over on Cascade Road, Dorothy Carpenter lived in the development across the street, across Cascade Road. And uh, in her later years, she's, she's about 80, and she started developing some dementia. And so we had actually arranged for someone to pick her up and bring her to church on Sunday morning. She would not miss. And we didn't want her to miss, you know. So anyways, we made that arrangement. But a, a, as things sort of progressed and her mind uh, became less, less focused, uh, she would get up in the morning and um, just head out for church. At the age of 80, navigating Cascade Road, you know, in between cars. <laughs> and she'd leave the stove on at home when she went to church. And guess what? Her family got involved. Right? They did something about it. Kind of stepped in, and that's kind of what families do. I'm just reminded here of how important words are. <laughs> here, power of Tychicus's words as an expression of love to encourage, to build up the church. He got involved in their life. We also see with Tychicus that families, well, I'm going to say, Families stick together. We're told that Tychicus was beloved. The people loved him. And it seems that part of this was because he was reliable. He was always there. The text says he was a faithful minister, working behind the scenes, serving faithfully. I'm told in different ones, Paul mentions Tychicus several different times. Tychicus had gone on several missionary journeys. He had been entrusted with large sums of money to take to the church in Jerusalem. He was a trustworthy, reliable guy. When you were in crisis, you could, could depend on Tychicus. This type of relationship doesn't develop in a day. It develops over years. It doesn't develop on the beach somewhere, on a fun trip. It develops in the trenches and battlefields, in living rooms, in hospital rooms, accident scenes, the ministry of presence. Now, some people don't develop loving relationships because they don't stick around long enough. <laughs> Keep others at bay emotionally, relationally. One of the things we learn from Tychicus is that love endures, it sticks together. Families stick together. Uh, finally, we see it embodied in Christ. Paul makes reference here to Christ. Peace be to the brothers, verse 23, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is the one who has brought about this peace that Paul is praying for. It's grounded. It's rooted in Christ. Christ established peace. According to Ephesians chapter 2, Christ established and secured this peace through his own blood. He died to establish our peace with God. Greater love has no one than this, than that someone lay down his life for his friends. The family's sacrifice, the greatest example we could ever have of what it is to love, we find in Christ. The text reminds us that there is no peace apart from Christ. I urge you today, if you're here today, apart from Christ, 
urge you to turn from your sin and look to Christ. Give up your futile attempts to sort of rectify your own situation and embrace the peace that God alone can provide through Christ. Humble yourself today. Turn to Christ. Well, we've come to develop all sorts of gauges for spiritual maturity, right? Do you read your Bible? Do you attend Bible studies? Do you avoid major catastrophic sins? These are all important, but do you love? Like Paul would say, orthodoxy isn't enough. Bible knowledge isn't enough. Avoiding heinous, debilitating sin is not enough. We are called to love. We are called to be family. We are called to adopt a bond with one another that is thicker than blood. We close this morning. Luke 15. You know the story. The prodigal son. Matter of fact, in that chapter, we have the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. And in reality, in that final parable, there's two lost sons. The older lost, or the younger son is clearly lost, and he knows it. Everyone knows it. He disrespected his father. He took his share of the inheritance. He squandered it in immoral living. But we also find in that parable that the older son is also lost, although it's much more subtle. He's obeyed all the father's rules. He's maintained orthodoxy. He's continued to do good works. He's continued to stay in his place. But we notice, don't we, that because he's estranged from his brother, He's resentful that his brother is being reinstated in the family. He's also at odds with who? The father. He too is lost. He just doesn't know it. And the text ends there. What will he do? What will happen to him? This is the concern that Paul is raising here can't be at odds with your siblings and enjoy a right relationship with your father. Are you committed to spiritual family? Have you embraced a bond that is thicker than blood? Father, we ask that you would stir our hearts today. We're thankful for this powerful message of the peace that has been provided for us through Christ. But we realize the call of this passage, God, in Paul's final words to the church, in his own hand, is a call to love. A call to move beyond simple orthodoxy, simple biblical knowledge, to truly embrace and embody a bond that is thicker than blood. Father, we ask your forgiveness for the times when we have not demonstrated the love that would be the mark of a follower of Christ. God, change us, restore us, renew us in our love for one another, that we would be the answer to Paul's prayer. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.